Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, look at this, some people already. Cookies, what are you talking about? <laughs> cookies, 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 if only, if only. Good morning, guys, good morning, gang. Surmises about the show and tell, what would you, is that all, has this, just, is, has this become a show and tell story? We should forget the car then, you know? Just take the, take the camera upstairs and then have a daily browse through the collection. That would be a lot easier for me. <laughs> Okay, before we start, the microphone thing, the microphone thing, it's been chaos. So before, I spent the last half an hour A, B, A, B, A, B testing. At the moment, the mic setup is what it has been. The zoom is there, going to the video interface, going into the computer. Is the audio reasonable? Give me a hint. Is the audio reasonable? This is what was set up yesterday, and when I played back the stream at lunchtime to hear it, was audio was chaos last time. Just chaos. All right, we have Plan B standing by. I've got the microphone here that I use for doing YouTube videos. I can plug it in, and I can plug this into the video card, cutting out the zoom. So if we have trouble later on today, we can maybe try this and see what happens. We'll set it aside. Okay, what's happening today is this. The block is basically ready for, for uh, what do you call it, for making color separations. I have ready today, I have four blank sheets of the paper we're going to use for making the color separations, which is our usual famous gumpy paper sprayed down to a carrier sheet. I will print four of these, because John's giving me a color separation with four colors for this. So we'll have five printings for this for this uh, set of chibis. There'll be a key block and color A, B, C, D. That's the plan anyway. What's this guy looking at? No idea. Our front door, which is closed. Anyway, but I had a look at John's file. Is, is John here? I don't know. See if he pops in. I had a look at John's file, and uh, and uh, we have to make some adaptations to it, because some of the things he's asked for doesn't work. I know he's done that quite quickly, I think, and he asked for color A, and usually we would do it, say, for example, color A and color B, and we could overlap color A and color B in a couple of places. But he's put color A and color B, and the place he's overlapped, he's cut out of color A. And these are the same family of colors, a tan with a brown over top. And lots of dot, 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 dots here and there. And there's no way that we're going to print carve dot, 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 dots, and then carve the holes, 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 and try and get them to match up. When it's a lighter color, we will carve it as a flatter area and put the darker dots on top of it. But John's asked for it to be cut out, and I think that he just misused the Photoshop file of it. So, so we're going to have to you know, adapt this as we go through here today. Anyway, let's do this. I've got some... Uh... Can you show us a separation? Yeah, I meant to do that. If I got it set up, but I didn't get it set up because I was doing audio testing. So actually, let's get that ready here. Excuse me for a few minutes while I muck with, uh, muck with the interface software here. I'm going to have to add some image files. Add. How should I do this? Let me, let me put them into a folder. Hang on one sec. Where are they? Jeez. New folder. Okay, do we fold it ready? Back to the add an image slideshow. Excuse me a second here, we really should have done this before we, uh, that directory. Hold 
I'm going to set some hotkeys just to say, excuse me guys, hang on about this. You can see this. This is the uh, darker brown or something. Hang on, this is the darker brown. Oh, where are we? Okay, this is the tan. And look at the meatballs inside the soup. He's given me dot, 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 dots there at the top end of the meatballs. And if we go to the darker brown one, here it is, he's cut out the dot, 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 dots on the meatballs. So what we need here is the lighter brown should go under this darker one. Instead of cutting the dot, dot, dots, let's go back to that one. This one should go under the entire surface of the meatball so that I don't have to spend the time cutting A and then cutting B. And look over at the roll. On the plate there, there's a roll of some kind of makizushi. The end of it has grains visible as a tan and a ring visible as tan. But when you go to the darker one, we've got to cut the A and the B. So that tan color should be under this whole thing. Where those four grains were cut, it should be under the whole circle. So we're going to have to look at these as we go through one by one. That's going to come in a few minutes. So some of these overlap partially, so he's done this. Some areas overlap and some areas he's left separate A and B. So I've got to have a look at this place by place by place and see. Dave is opening a meatball shop, yeah, so, 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 so. Okay. Let's take this a step at a time. First step, I will now print four blank sheets for color separation. This is the part where I spray spray all across the front of my shirt. By the way, printing, printing, printing. The octopus is done. My batch of the octopus is, I believe, done. I did. I, well, I was going to do 60, 60. And I did the first 60 last week and got only 40 good ones. There was a lot of testing and futzing around on that. So, so the second one I did 80, and that should give me 60 good ones. We'll find out when I take them out of the boards today. My job the next week then, starting well, starting today actually, is going to be catching up on the shipping. There's a bunch of backlog shipping. The first shipment of prints that went by FedEx to our new American shipping center arrived there yesterday, and they are now being prepared for shipping within the U.S. So it looks like we may have got the shipping thing cracked. Thanks very much to Jed's support. Jed and his assistant are going to act as our U.S. shipping center while this chaos is going on. The Japanese post office has stopped accepting packages from the US.
Will we get tracking numbers for the octopus print? Yes. Uh, where, uh, blah, 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 blah. where do you live? Where do you live? Where do you live? Uh, the prints we are shipping now, everything US based now is going to be shipped, okay, through to Jed, and he will then forward it on by USPS. Oh, she got some money, though. If you live in a few European countries that are still accepting, then they're going to go directly to you. If you live in Germany, uh, who's it accepting? Germany is accepting Britain is. Uh, I, I can't remember. Cameron's got the list. I don't really know what it is. If you're in a European country that's not accepting, Italy, Spain, uh, Switzerland, then for the moment you're going to hang on for a bit. And we are arranging, if, if Jed's shipping system works well, we are arranging a second depot in Europe. And then we will ship to a central European depot and that, those people there, will forward it on. This conversation here, I'm sorry. The all the larger prints we're doing these days, things like Great Wave, the Octopus, always, always, always they have tracking. None of those. The only things that go without tracking these days are the smaller things like some subscription prints that go in an envelope, like a letter, as a first-class letter. And those, by definition, don't have tracking. We can upgrade them to tracking, but they don't, by definition, have. But all larger packages, the octopus, whatever, are tracked, always. You haven't got your tracking number, don't worry, it hasn't been public. The first group of octopus prints, if you're in the first 40, if you were one of the first 40, and I can't tell at the moment, those went to Jet. Jet has now opened them. They arrived at Jet's place in a big FedEx box, individually. The addresses also went to Jed separately, of course. Now, Jed and his assistant are, as we speak, they are printing out the addresses, putting them on the packages, and then sending them out within the U.S. Now, that's the point where the tracking number gets born. I have no tracking number for you yet, individually, because the box went on en masse to Jed's place. So once Jed has sent it, Jed's assistant, once she has sent it, she will be reporting back to us, and then Cameron will report the tracking number to you. And that will be a, a domestic US tracking number, not coming from Japan. So don't be worried about this yet. And if you're not in the first 40, if you're in the second group, then those are the ones that are drawing upstairs. They are going to go this week to Jed en masse, the American Group ones for America. And the same thing will happen again next week. There's also a third group of octopuses, and the ones we when we opened the page for the octopus, we said Dave is going to make the first 100. He's going to print them by himself. And we did that. The page said carved by Dave, printed by Dave, blah 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 blah. But once I had once it, it moved up that those were all spoken for, we changed the webpage and we changed the printer's name from David to Yamamoto san who is our staff printer. So if you, if you were after the first hundred, and you would have seen the, the order page was different, then that group hasn't even started printing yet. So if, that's, if you're way down the line to that point. Anyway, questions about tracking, just write to the Mokohankan, info at mokohankan.com. Cameron will get to it at some point. Actually, it's the weekend now, so I shouldn't say this, but during the week, yes.
Is there somewhere you can check your number? No, the tracking numbers don't exist yet. They haven't been mailed. Once they're mailed and Jed's assistant puts them in the post, that's when tracking numbers will, will be available for everybody. Okay, print number. There's no numbers on the prints. There's no numbers. They're not numbered. You got number one, you got number two, you got number three. We do not number the prints, period. Just I made a batch of a hundred of them and I'm signing every one and out they go. Then the next ones will be made by Yamamoto Cup. So when you ordered, if it said on the web page you were getting one of the first hundred made by Dave, then that's what you're in for. If you look at the order page now, it doesn't say that anymore. It just says printed by Mokohankan staff printers. Okay, I've got to do some work here. Okay, I've got to, I'll pop up that s slideshow we saw a moment ago, and I've got to try and draw on here now. So you can't really see both at the same time. What should I do here? It to me. If I, if I kill the outside view for a bit here, just a minute. If I take this down, and if I put the slideshow over here, that's kind of small. I need to be able to. Okay, here we go. So as we said, I pointed out one place where I think John is not doing it the way I want it to be done. But there's lots of other places he's overlapped. Let's have a look. If we go back... Yeah, okay, look at this. The, the base of the larger bowl. This is the darker color. It's a shadow around the bottom of the bowl and then some sort of highlights, dark lights at the bottom of the bowl. If we go back to the lighter color... So, here we are. The lighter color expands in a wider zone around the bottom of the bowl. So we will see those two clearly different. How about the chopsticks? They are almost all on the lighter color with a white highlight. Uh, so, and this is different. This makes sense. So these are mostly okay. I'm not, you're not yelling at John here. But it was just the dots in those meatballs that doesn't make any sense. Okay, so my job now is to identify these zones. So that we can cover. What paper is backing my hunch there? It's nothing, it's just the yellow one or... Not the official... I think I shouldn't have touched that more. Here's the official package. It's nothing, it's just, it's just paper. It's colored paper, it's like illustration type stuff. It's marked as being thick. It's A3 size, here's your size. Look at this. There's nothing special, it's just commercial paper. I know we tried a bunch of different stuff. The paper we used for the print party room, for example, I used to use that for a while. But that paper actually expands and contracts too much on the moisture. This one seems very, very stable. On a sunny day and a rainy day, it doesn't change so much. So, for example, if it had been raining yesterday when I prepared these, now it's a clear day, I don't have to worry, the paper's not going to change size so much. But don't sweat it. You want a stable, 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 stable paper. That's all you need. Well, cardstock, I don't know, you've got to print it, remember. If it's, if it's thick like a card, then you can't do your actual printing on it. So it's got to be thin enough. Thin enough to print on and stable enough. And anyway, you wouldn't, like I printed this just now, and this is going to be pasted down today, absolutely. I will not wait for another day. If I do this, printed these today, and it really started raining tomorrow, then this paper could possibly have expanded a bit and my colors wouldn't match. So this is a one-day job, absolutely.
Oh, look at that, there's a line missing. The edges of the meatballs are gone. No idea. Anyway. No, it was random. It was random. I don't, know. I don't really remember. Was there? Was I thinking which one was up on top, which one was on the bottom? I don't really know. It was just random. I think. I think maybe John, the, the Photoshop file, the original sketches were in a different order. I don't know. There's no specific reason why one should be up and one should be down. We print the same number of copies. Everybody in the Patreon system gets one, of course, one of each. It's not part of the meatball, I got that wrong. Soka, soka, soka. Meatball ends here. Okay, is that it for this one?
Yes, I can see a couple of spots I missed already. Come on, people, back me up here. Catch the mistakes. Do I know how many impressions the print will be? Yes, there's going to be five. It's going to be the key block and then four of these colors. If, if that's how it works. And I'll just rotate. This is the light tan color. Edge of the tray. Is that what you're talking about? Karen Sam? Got it, got it, got it. Anything else? Anything else? I think we're okay little spot to the left of the bottom meatball. I think I'm in there actually. I did. If this is the spot you mean here, the top half of it has got marked in as a colour. The four colours will be a tan like this. It'll be a, probably a skin colour I guess. Then this is just a darker highlight colour. It's a little bit difficult to see here. I'm not quite sure what this one's going to be. And this will be the other, this will be over the tan, a darker brown. So you've got some areas that double up. The meatball here, over here. The chopsticks, they'll be doubling up some of the shadow. And then the other group will be, I don't quite know what color this is, a lilac. So there'll be a lilac and a blue. There's two color groups that'll be working here. The bowl and fish and background is one color group. And then, as you saw, the inside ingredients and the chopsticks are another color group. We'll see. Should the area on the sushi roll side go a bit higher in places? You mean this thing? I don't know. Up here, you mean, yeah, it's a bit of a higher spot. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. You're talking to it. What's the color behind the soup bowl to right side? It's part of the shadow, I guess. Part of the shadow effect. I don't know. Are we okay? All right, let's move to the other one.
remember how they did this in the 19th century, just exactly the same way, except it probably wouldn't be the carver doing this. The, the designer would do his design. He sends it in. The designer sends in his design at the actual size, or people trace at the actual size. The designer's design gets pasted on the block, carved up. They then print a bunch of these sheets exactly like you see me here, and then either these sheets go back to the designer. Okay, Mr. Amos, give me your color separations, please. Then the designer sits down doing what I'm doing right now. He's got no Photoshop, he's just sitting. Okay, here's what I want. Here's the shade you want here. He draws over there's the shade you want here. Sometimes, when it's a zone already clear, he would just check off, hi, hey, in here, make that purple. And sometimes he would have drawn as you see me drawing here. That's the designer's job for major work. For cheap, simple work, it doesn't matter, the workshop workers themselves, the carver, printer, team, the publisher as a guy, would take these and do exactly what I'm doing now. Just saying, okay, let's see, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. Because they all knew what they were doing, they knew the end goal. They didn't use highlighters, they would use a brush. And the, in, traditionally it was done with a, a vermilion pigment, uh, a weak vermilion pigment. If you paint too much on these, they get distorted from the wetness, and then when you paste them down, the lines don't match. So you've got to be careful not to let these sheets get too wet, even nowadays when you're doing it. That's why I use the highlighters. There's no moisture per se in this. If I did this with a watercolor pigment, the paper will swell and expand, killing the whole point. With our Ukiwe Hills work, this should be done by Jet, actually. It should be done by Jet. Okay, where am I? Where's next? Where's next? Where's next? Where am I? To need a finger. Do you hear the sound out there is the and then runs every four or five minutes. It's the air conditioners from the giant shopping center down the street. And during the day it's not so bad, but at night that's all you can hear. And I'm going to write them a letter, I think. I, I stood it as long as I could last summer. And yesterday they stood it up again for this year. And uh, it's unbearable. It's just too loud. Nothing will happen, but I've got to try and make a bit of noise. Okay guys, I think we're okay on this one as well. Can you back stop me on this? Where am I up here? Have I caught it all? Ask the bag lady, let me write the letter. It's funny, you know, last summer when this was on, uh, I chatted with a couple of people in the community and they're all like, what do I say? I said, that noise, the one that runs all night, you know, you can hear it, it goes and you every two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. <coughs> then we're here, because they're running their own air conditioners. 
They sleep with the windows closed and the air conditioner roaring. Dave likes to sleep with the window open and no air conditioner, but I'm probably the only guy in town who likes to do that. So, so I'm the only one this is bothering. Left hand, okay, what have we got here? Left hand, left hand, uh, left thumb. Ah, okay, okay, right you are. Uh, left you are. Squiggly tail of the Takino Kawa. I think I've got it, you know. It's here. I colored in those two places. If that's what you mean. They are colored in. You mean they don't show in the in there. I think it's okay, you know, I think it's okay, I think it's okay, I think it's okay. I think we're good to go, you know. Rice should be yellow. The rice should be yellow. If you mean this part, that's going to be paper color. And this is a highlight coming up from the bottom. If we flip through all of the color steps here, I think there's no color in this area. This will be white rice. I believe. Let's have a look. So, there's nothing there. The tray itself will be white. The rice will be white. One spot in the sushi roll is higher. Here you mean? Well, I think you mean you want me to bring this up a little bit. I don't think John is really concerned about that. John wanted a wiggly line here, but okay, if that's what you mean. On the end. Oh, I see. The other end, you mean up here? Well, I've got it there, actually. It's coming up there. <laughs> okay. That's cool. What I'm worried about is something big that I have missed. And I don't think there's anything major missing here. Shape is a bit different now. Look at that. I got that a bit wrong. Let's pull that a bit up. You should have called me up on that, eh? That's the sound, can you hear it? Can you hear the sound that well? It's mostly when it goes down and when it goes up, it's when it wakes you up and brings you to life. Shadow under the left pinky. I've got one there, if that's what you mean here. There is a shadow, I've got it in there. I have put one in there. It's perhaps not quite so visible, but it's there. It's loud during the day. At night, it's unbearable. I mean, there's, there's traffic, there's people just walking, there's, there's the general hum of the city. And it's still noisy. And upstairs with my window open at night when there's nothing else, it's just... I can't even listen to music. You're listening to something. If there's anything with a pause in the music... Anyway, grumble, grumble, grumble. Okay, okay, okay. Ha 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 ha. Time to get carving on the color blocks, which are still upstairs on the third floor. Yeah, the sound is gone right now. It'll come back in a minute. I have to disappear. I'm going to go upstairs and find two pieces of wood. 
whatever is inside the roll should not be yellow. Yes, that's the way we are going to overlap here. We are going to overlap. That's going to be a brown coming on top, but we wanted to overlap this. Ah, okay, before I go put the street camera back up. That makes sense. You guys are on this today. I should be I should be distributing chocolate eggs all over the place. Here's a street camera. I'm gonna go upstairs now. It's gonna take me five minutes or so. I've got to get to the wood storage section, find some, look at a few blocks, find one, find one, find one. So this is gonna take me three, four, five minutes. You already have enough guests. Okay, back in a few minutes, guys. Behave yourself. See, tell you what, while I'm gone, just for fun, I'm going to put something on the table here. Just for fun, while I'm gone, I'm going to put something on the table. We might be talking about this later. We might not. Be. I don't know. Who knows? Okay, four or five minutes. Excuse me.
Yeah, the, the stairs are outside the shop. So, you know, the building has a huge long history. Uh, when it was first built, it was it was part of a larger group of buildings here that was one business. It was a famous restaurant called the uh, uh, Noguchi Shokudo. Restaurant, one of the restaurants with a huge long history. One of the earliest restaurants to be developed in the Meiji era. That was in a different location at that time. Then this cluster of buildings, uh, the buildings that were put back together after the devastation of the war, they put a cluster of buildings together and it was Noguchi Shokudo. Then it, business changed, 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 changed. It became, for a while, it became a high-class uh, Inoshishi Ryori, uh, a restaurant serving on uh, a wild boar, grilled wild boar. And there were uh, tatami mat rooms everywhere with gas in each room, and you would grill the, the stuff on your, on your table. Then it was split up. The first floor became a noodle shop. It was a ramen shop. In fact, when we did our floor here, when we had the floor ripped up, we could see the old counter, a long, thin counter. It was like a Western lunch counter. People came in and they sat on the outside of this looped counter, and the guy serving walked in and out and went back to the kitchen at the back. So this, that, at that time, they changed the stairs, so it was rented to different people. There were people residential upstairs. There were people living, and it was a noodle shop downstairs. So the building has lots and lots and lots of history. So we came in on the second floor. First, people were living on the third floor. At that time, there was a jeweler on the first floor. Then the guy moved out. We got the third floor. Then the jeweler finally moved out. We got the first floor. And we would have liked to rebuild the stairs so that people just come in the front door and then go upstairs from here instead of going outside. And we were planning that. And that plan is now on hold because we may be, and this is still not set. We may be giving up the first floor and retreating up to second and third because there's not going to be any tourists here for years and years and years to come. So we, we do not need to be paying high expensive rent for a street level shop when there's no need for it. But we do need a workshop so we may keep the second and third for the workshop. It's still all vague, it's still all whatever. Okay, 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 okay. No, the buildings don't have, uh, there's no back door to this building, nothing. None of these buildings have back doors here. No, 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 no back door. Uh, these were built in a day when fire regulations and stuff were very, very different from what they are now. There is a, there's a, in the old days the buildings were built wall to wall. Like, for example, this building and the building that used to be a shoe stop, the kimono shop, now they are wall to wall, but bang to bang. The next one also, the guy living next door that was an Italian restaurant, that's now a, a, a what is it, they sell kaki oysters. This used to be butted right to bit, but he rebuilt his. And he rebuilt it at a time about 20 years ago when the regulation said you have to come back 20 centimeters from the, from the property line. So our building is on the property line and his building comes back 20 centimeters. Just enough for a cat to get through, but not enough for a person to come through. So those rules have changed now. And if we rebuild ours, we have to come back 50 centimeters. 50 centimeters, a foot and a half from the property line, both sides. So if we bought this building and rebuilt it, we would, instead of having a building this wide, we would all of a sudden have a building this wide. It is 50 centimeters now, but it was 20 at that time. It's also, it's different depending on how high it is and what part of town you're in. It's not a single number that's all for the whole of, of Tokyo. So if we did have this building as ours to rebuild, it would be actually a terrific problem. You lose a staggering amount of your volume, about a quarter of the volume of the floor space we lose because of those rules. Then stairways have to be wider, there has to be an elevator, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we would lose a stunning amount of floor space, but we would gain probably one more. We could go to four, and we could maybe go to five high. So we would have a, a, a noodle shop, whatever, <laughs> tall, thin. So I don't know. It is an idea that's actually in play. You, know, you can laugh at me in the middle of all this chaos and we're broke and everything else, but the idea is 
there's, a, there's an interesting dynamic. The hotel across the street is a place where there used to be three or four shops. This was before my time. There was a bunch of smaller old round travel shops. And somebody, some giant corporation came in and made offers to everybody. Look, if you sell, you sell, you sell, you sell, we can build. So they, they, they tear down four small buildings. And instead of making four skinny buildings, of course, they've got now one big lot to make a huge building, which has got its 50 centimeter setback at each side. So it makes sense for a whole bunch of different buildings to be all torn down together. It turns out the guy next door who lives upstairs from the Oyster Shack, he was born in that building. He ain't going anywhere. He's not selling. The building where the kimono is, they just renovated it. The girl upstairs who owns it just put a new roof on, new painting and everything, put a new sign. She's obviously not thinking about selling. So this one by itself, this lady is kind of stuck. She cannot get a deal together with one of these real estate agents to buy the whole thing, buy the whole block, the block and rebuild. She's stuck. She's stuck. There's nothing she can do. All she can do is, she's an elderly lady, she's 76 or something like that. All she can do is cross her fingers and hope that she gets a good stable tenant who pays their rent all the time and that there's no earthquake strong enough to make the building to a condemned level because this building is old, old, old. So she doesn't have a future here. She can't renovate, she can't sell. All she needs is a good stable tenant. Okay, we are going to paste this down. I said this, this one thing, what she needs is a good stable tenant, of course. I mean, any landlord needs that. But in her case, there really are no other options. But the other thing to it, and I don't know the background here, what other properties she owns, what's her income, does she have a loan on this place or anything like that, I don't know that. But another option for her would be uh, to take a buyout, you know, to sell it so that that problem becomes somebody else's problem. And that could happen in a few ways. You, these large real estate companies, they've got lots of cash, they now recognize that property values in Tokyo are crashing everywhere because of this problem. So it would be in their interest, the large companies, to just scoop stuff up. Just here and there, scoop stuff up. That one's not for sale yet, doesn't matter, they can wait one day. So scoop things up. So she could sell it, but she wouldn't get a prime price for it at that level. Okay, I'm gonna make a noise here. I'm gonna make a single, sharp, loud tap. Those of you who have headphones, headphone wearers, be careful please, I'm gonna make a sharp noise. Ready, count down, three, two, one, ready. screen but not really paying attention. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> I could have turned the mic off I guess for that. But it... In fact that might make more sense. Turn the mic off but touching the mic whatever. No, she would have to sell the land. No, it doesn't work like that. She doesn't own the land. She only owns the building. All the land in this area, all the land around here, is owned by Sensoji Temple. So there's no land sales happening here. When you buy and sell property in this, this I'm talking about this part of Tokyo, not Tokyo in general. 
what you're selling when you, if she sold this to me, what she's selling is the physical structure of the building, the pieces, the beams, that's what I would be buying. I would be buying the right to use this land, the, the lease, the land lease, I guess. And that has to be purchased separately. So if we bought the building, it would be X half a million dollars or something like that. I think that's about what you paid for it. So it would be half a million or so for the building. And then it would be another $50,000, 500, 5 million yen. That pays to the temple for the transfer of the lease from her to me. That would be about a $50,000 fee. And then on top of that, you've got the lawyers and everything else. So we're looking at about half a million to buy the old building. And then, of course, the first earthquake comes and down she goes. So, so it's a half a million investment in a ramshackle building. So, and that's her problem. That's what she owns. No, the street cam has no mic. That's not the way that the handy cams work. It's a handy cam out there, and we've got the HDMI feed coming from the handy cam. And by American government law, handy cams like that are not allowed to output audio. They're only allowed to output video. It's because of the you know video dubbing stuff that was going on years ago. So there's no street audio unless I get a separate mic and set it out there. Okay, what are we doing? Oh, look at this, look at this, 10 out of 10, already! I have bad news for you, that wasn't the peel, that was the backing paper coming off. <laughs> Somebody's being a bit premature. <laughs> That's okay, I'll take it. world's thinnest woodblock print. <laughs> there we go. It doesn't get any clearer than this for carving. Absolutely. It doesn't get any clearer than this. You saw too what we pulled off there actually. We talk about this paper coming, people think it comes up in half. This just came off the back, and I don't know how much it was, but part of it, let me play with this here. More started to peel. It would be possible, maybe, I'm not going to destroy my work here, but look at this. 
we could perhaps, probably, maybe do another peel. Do you see what's happening here? More of this stuff is coming up. There's still more paper left there. It's not all taken away. We can keep going down and down and down. I'm going to play with it. That's a good one. How's our time? 9.05. Okay. Let's do a bit of carving. What normally, if this was a normal thing, I would now do all four of these. Trace the next one, paste it. Trace the next one, paste it. Trace the next one, paste it. And that's what I'll be doing after the stream is over. But to make sure these things, I'm going to put them in plastic. Make sure they don't dry out. Keep them stable as possible. Can you, what's this? Blue, glue, glue. Can, can I at least see my glue, please? I'm not sure what you mean. You mean the glue we just used? I'm not sure the question here. It's the usual. It says, Arabic Yamato. And the reason it says Yamato, that's what it means Japan. And Yamato Nori is the normal white glue that we use. But this is Arabic Yamato. In other words, it's basic glue made of gum Arabic instead of like the rice paste and stuff like that. And to me, again, this is the stuff that when I was a kid we used to call mucilage. It was a school glue that came in a thing with a, a triangular angle top and you rub the triangle top across your, your stuff like that. Used it all. What are you talking about? We buy it in, in, we get the little one, and then we buy actually, I, I don't have it in front of me, it's upstairs in Cameron's office. We buy a big one, a refill. So we refill these, refill these, refill these. And it's funny, the top thing here, it's a screw on top. You can, you can, you know, dispense it through here. And these get gummed up. So when you buy a refill, it comes with a bunch of extra tops for your small ones. Do a little bit of carving. And all for the show and tell today, we do have show and tell, but what I did when I sat there upstairs, I realized the show and tell that we had wasn't the last on Monday, it was, I forget, whatever, a week or so ago. Two, two show and tells ago, I, can, I can't remember. I showed you some black folders full of some Taisho era subscription prints. And a couple of people have written to me asking for more information on those. And what I did was today, I just brought the same photo, well, more of those folders back down. So I've got today we'll look at a few more of those same things. So to be a little bit of a semi-repeat show and tell. We've got the same group of prints that I showed the other day, but today we will look at a few of them a bit more carefully. There was just too many to show and discuss. I showed you some point about it, but today we'll just browse. We'll have a look through that collection, just browsing. So remind me again in 10 minutes or so. glue like that in, in, in America. It's just, just school mucilage glue. Don't they make it anymore? Anyway, it's just glue. I mean, you, your own culture has glue. Just find some glue that sticks paper down to a piece of wood. It's, uh, there's nothing here that's, you know, exotic or, or just related to Japanese woodblock printmaking. It's just glue.
his life is funny. You, know, you guys, you saw the video the other day, Ito-san. The, the, the tool I had with me that day, I had not had the collar on this. I had been struggling with the collars because they'd been breaking, and I had just tied a bit of, actually the, the one that day had a bit of string plus some tape around it. And unfortunately for me, what had happened was that knife blade actually was near the end of its life. It's similar to the one we're looking at now. Oh no, no, this is a new one, it goes all the way down. The one I had that day was quite short, so the knife ended here and then it stuck out. And it, because of there wasn't much knife inside the handle, and it was just wrapped with tape, it was a bit wobbly. I should have known better than to go to his house with a wobbly blade. So he grabbed it, wobbly, 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 and he didn't complain to me, but he said, you know, get some, either get a brass collar or get some, some string, you know, get some chamisan string. So here's Dave now, 30, 30 years later, 28 years later. I'm using a brass collar on this particular one, but the collar now, because I'm, at, I'm sharpening it at a lower angle these days, the collar itself gets hit on the sharpening stone, and I've now run to the end of the collar, and the collar is broken. So at this point, of course, the collar becomes useless, so throw it away, so I should head out and get a piece of chamisan string and, uh, and tie this one day. I'm re-watching that video when I was doing the editing this week, you know, it really, really, really took me back, you know. I was there for the original filming in 1992, I'm there in the video, but I have not seen that stuff since then. So for me, this last week, looking at those videos for the editing process, for me, it was, I said in the video, it's a real time travel, it was, I hadn't seen that stuff since 1992. A bunch of it I know, the sharpening, it's okay, I got that pretty much okay, the omote ura, the front and back of the brush, I got that figured out. So there's not much that I learned this time around, but it was really interesting to see Dave geeking like that. Oh my god, look at his eyes popping out of his head watching this stuff. You know. And there's a bunch of stuff that I didn't put into that sequel. And I'm holding it in reserve. There's going to be a third one. First was the visit. It's the story about the visit, remembering a carver, just introducing ito -san. And the second video was the one you just saw this week. And there will be part three. Somewhere, somewhere down the line there will be part three. Because there's a bunch more things still to show.
frame. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Where am I here? Oops. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Speak louder, okay? I can't hear you. This is why we use the scope to make sure I'm in frame. <laughs> sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Don Quixote, they have a new slide in the chamois and strings. Not anymore. They have changed dramatically in the past couple of years. Actually, they may be changing dramatically again. When we came here five, six years ago, we used Don Quixote all the time. We were doing construction work here, and whatever we needed, ah, they got it down there. And they did. They had everything in the world, and they had a huge hardware department. The hardware department is now almost gone. Over the past few years, it was shrunk, 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 shrunk. And what came in, in place of it was backpacks, backpacks, shopping trolleys, uh, suitcases, travel goods, pillows to wear in an airplane, all that kind of stuff. They knew their market and their Chinese tourists, and it changed dramatically. More half of the donkey became travel gear, low-priced junk Chinese travel gear. So there's no way am I going to get my shamisen string at Don Quixote anymore. But having said that, I'm sure now they are in the middle of another major renovation. So much for that carving. There we go. A whole bunch of carving done this morning. <laughs> All right. We'll show and tell. Let's grab one of these. There's lots, lots more. Every page has a story. Whatever, every page has interesting stuff. Get some of this ink out of the way before I spill it. Where do we start? A couple of things. Let's grab. Whatever, let's just grab the first one that comes in hand. And some of the things I tried to point out about these prints the other day. And for those who weren't here, these are Taisho era reproductions. They came as subscription series, usually two prints at a time. This is a volume number 18. I'm upside down with text. I can't see this. It's two prints with volume 18. And it turns out they came every two weeks, it seems. I, had, I think I said the other day it was monthly. It seems that they were a two-week, two-week subscription series. And this is in the 1915, 1920, maybe into the 1920s era. And I got a bunch of these a few years back from the Amara Show 10. I paid 2,000 yen each for them. I have no idea what they would be charging now. The internet has changed all the used book dealers and stuff here now, so I don't really know. I got these decades ago, decades ago, and I bought a bulk of them en masse. I remember telling a story here on the Show and Tell not too long ago about the bunch of the small prints, the Shote prints. I had been browsing in the shop. The guy brought out a box, put it in the counter. I looked in the box, checked it, and picked up the box, took it back to the counter. The day I bought these was a similar thing. He didn't bring it out while I was there, but I go into the shop, look at this, look at this, there's a box of these things. As soon as I realized what it was, that's it. I just pick up the box and take it straight to the counter. And the girl says, yes, I just get my credit card out and give it to her. They're an astonishing, astonishing bargain. They're not really worth anything. Here in Japan, nobody cares about prints like this. So they're worthless here in Japan. But for a person who's interested in the technique and the beautiful object, look at this. Just look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. Come on, lose my focus. It's a rich, thick paper. Now this is actually, this is overkill. And somebody here in Japan who's artistic, a lady who does flower arranging, or somebody who cares about poetry, they would look at this and think this is grotesque. And in a sense, it is. One, it's about ukiyo-e. This is a picture of a prostitute in a broth roll. I mean, this is nothing to do with, with nice art. And look at it. The paper is so thick that we get this puffy effect on it. The printed parts push down too far. So it's not any kind of a delicate, beautiful thing. But just, they are so... Beautiful, <laughs> whatever. 
It's the Taisho era carving. It's hard. You can see. Look at this. The hairlines are very black. They're brittle. They're okay, but every line is really, really hard. It's a kind of carving that was in vogue for about, I don't know, about 20 years or so, when all they were making these ukiyo reproductions. And all I can guess is that it was the generation of carvers that wasn't really trained in real ukiyo. They just come along to, to learn the shape of it. The colors are super rich, super dense, and the paper is not fine, thick hosho paper. Look. It's quite thick, beautifully smooth on the surface. And I don't know if you can see on the back. Yeah, you can maybe get this. Look at this. The striations from the barren. The barren pressure was an astonishing level of barren pressure. Let's try and get the light here to show some of the striations. Let me find a spot. Hang on. Let me hunt around here. Okay, can you see it there? Please. Got it. Chuk, 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 chuk. These are strokes of the barren from the back. Vivid, vivid, very high pressure strokes. The paper has been scratched. I mentioned that there were two companies, there were actually a bunch of smaller companies involved, but there were two major companies doing these things. And it's really interesting to find that the prints they published overlap quite a lot. Now, I don't know if they were in super competition or maybe, you know, you could imagine a situation, the company A starts doing it, one of the managers quit and says, I can do this better, and he opens up his own outfit, something like that. It looks like that kind of thing happened because we get cases like this. Company A has published a print, and Company B comes along and does the same thing. Now, I don't have anywhere, any knowledge of the data which came first or which came second. They are, these are adaptations of ukiyo so they're not perfect line-for-line -line reproductions of an ukiyo So one of these companies has done it first, and then the other company has simply totally ripped off this ad adaptation to make a similar adaptation. And how, there's questions, well, I don't know, whatever, I can't do both, I can't, I can't show these and, and, and questions, whatever. But let's have a look at this. I know it's, it's the same print and the same color patterns and the same everything, but when you get close to it, how do we know that these are different Let's take a cherry pick a couple of easy examples here. You can see, let's look at these, this hair carving. They are negative hairs here, not positive hairs. And if you look at these two blocks side by side, anybody can see this is not the same set of blocks. Well, if I look at this here, look at, look at the hair down here. So this is two different carved block sets for the quote, same, unquote. But you can see it. Look, the line here, uh, where, the line here, and the lines here. So these are the same print, but made by a different carving team and a different printing team. Every line is different. These guys, I think, had a little bit more taste and sense. This one is a bit more chop, 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 chop. These ones are feathered a bit nicely. These ones come to the end and are chopped off. So if I was going to just guess, put my money on it, this was the first team, and these are the rip-offs. But again, neither of these are originals. These are all adaptations of an ukiyo-e that would have been published 100 years before this. So these are Taisho-era adaptations. It's clear this one's much more refined. The color layering is much more delicate. These ones are not mixed with color. The colors are not mixed very well. If I was looking at these two in a shop, which one would I want, which one would I buy, there's no, absolutely no doubt about it. This one on the right is a much nicer production than the one on the left. Although on the face of it, like whatever, who cares, they're pretty much the same thing. You can even see the black, it's a deeper, richer black. It all comes down to such tiny details, you know. If this was the only one you had, 
You could look at it and say, wow, this is cool, this is such nice carving, you know, it's also very nice. If this is all you knew, you would think, it's magnificent, they're straight, they're perfect, they all come to the same place, you know, blah, 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 blah. But when you see somebody who can do it better, and this is not the be all end all, it could, we could go one more and see another one, you know. There's one show and tell we've got to have one day, I can't do it in the middle of a stream. I've got three sets of Adachi prints that were published in the 1970s, 80s, and then the 50s, 60s, and then in the Taisho era. And these are recuts, it's the same publication they did in three generations of carvers. And the newest one, it's okay, it's nice. Then you go back a generation, oh, now I see how it should be done, and then I pull that aside to show the Taisho era one, and then we just shake bricks. It's, oh my God, look at what that really could be. There's no end to this stuff. There's no end to this stuff. There's another interesting thing about this group of subscription prints. It's really heavy on prints from the early era of ukiyo-e production, the, the earliest days of ukiyo-e. And then it moves forward to lots of haranobu, lots of hiroshige. And then there's no utamaro, just one or two, and there's very, very few. There's a few here, I think. So there's very, very few hokusai and stuff like that. So I think they had a plan to do a master series that covered the whole gamut of ukiyo-e. And then either they lost their subscriptions or something went wrong or there was a, a, a bad economic time they ran into or something like that. And they didn't get completed. But these guys were good. This is a colorized hoaxer. The original was not colored. They've colorized this. Very. Very, very nice carving, but again, very hard. Every line is the same. It's the, the key blocks are printed too dark. I thought that was the sun, it's my thumb. Beautiful balancing of the colors, you know. Just beautiful balancing of the colors. It's the gray trick. We've talked about this before. There's no raw color anywhere on any of these prints. For example, the yellow here, it's yellow plus red to make a Yamabuki, but not just that. They've put a tiny, tiny bit, this is a total top secret, they've put a tiny, tiny bit of grey into this as well. So every single colour you see on this whole print, every single colour has a smidgen of grey, in well, some, some cases more than a smidgen, but anything has at least a smidgen of grey in it. And that gives these things an overall tone and an overall blend. All through this era, there was never such thing as a raw color being used by itself. Everything had a smidgen of gray into it. Nice gradations. They're uh, deworming the boat. Eh? Boats, uh, this is not something inherently Japanese. Cultures, all cultures do this. They would bring the boat up on shore and use fire, burn off all the you know, uh, worms and stuff that are eating into the wood. You know, burn up the boat, but it's, uh, you burn off the you know, insects and whatever else is living on there. I think they're burning it first, right? This is obviously fire. They're getting rid of it, getting clean, burning off all the, the insects, and then maybe they go ahead and paint it. I've got no idea. Another specifically nice one to look at. No idea. Actors. There is some Utamaru in the series. I said none, but there is some, but very, very, very few. <laughs> this paper, it's like cardboard. It's so thick, think right? We wouldn't even think this was printable. We wouldn't think it's printable. Like, why did you give this to me? I can't print with this. But these guys, not only could they print with it, not only did they print with it, look at what's going to happen here. And how close we can get here. Uh, 
I don't know, it's going to fuzz out in a second here. There's hair here. Not the black one that you see up top. But there's hairs one by one by one. And I cannot, as I see it right now, I cannot see these. I need the microscope to be able to see these. These have gone so delicate. Can you see it? <coughs> Look at the scale. There's my finger, and this is on thick, thick cardboardy paper. There's also a kimedashi on this. We talk about karazuri, where a pattern is carved. You press the paper, and it leaves an embossed pattern. But there's a kimedashi, where you take the paper from the back. You see the nose here, and they've pushed it from the back to leave. You can see what's happened. And again, it looks a bit grotesque. If I get the light too much, it makes it look a bit grotesque. And I think, I don't know who would call this beautiful, but it's an astonishing, astonishing effect. The faces are always so just grotesque, and that's the convention of how they did ukiyo-e faces. And this is nice. The key block is done in a nice gray. This one's nice. Somebody had some sense that day. The rich, rich, rich kimono patterns. And don't ask me that. Of course, I cannot read this. Anyway, so just uh, rambling on a bit. We've got, you know, we've got, like I said, hundreds of these here now. I mean, just any given one, you could sit and look at it for hours and just keep enjoying. I did. I did one of the Davies Choice videos a while back, you know, a couple of years back, where I took one print and just said, we can have an exhibition with just one print. And you could do that with almost any one of these. You can make an exhibition, just a single print, show people, look at this, look at this, how's this carved, look what's going on, look at this double impression, you know. There's always enough, in, enough going on in these prints that you could keep people's attention for a long, long time. My interest in them really, of course, is technical. I'm not really a fan of ukiyo-e as it is. Look at the detail here, you know. My interest is technical mostly, but uh, it's okay. It's okay, it's okay. All right, that'll do. I think we're probably almost out of time. Oh, we're over time already. Sorry about that, excuse me. Okay, what's the schedule? Today is Saturday. I'll be back here. You know what I'll be doing for the next few days, obviously, for the next bunch of while. We have four color blocks to, to cut for this uh, Patreon chibi print. And that's going to take me the next, you know, I'll be saving it for streams. So over the next few streams, excuse me, I will be carving the color blocks for this chibi, this chibi series. What comes next after that? Oh my God, I can't, I can't see that far down the line. I don't know. Who knows? So I'm not sure what next week's work will all be about, but there will be some kind of work going on somewhere. Thanks so much, guys. I'm out here, not today. I'll be back here Monday morning. Weather permitting, everything permitting. Thanks for hanging in. It's been, a, I think it's been a useful stream today. You know, a lot of you guys have seen this time and time and time again. Whatever, whatever, things are what they are. Okay, thanks very much. I'm now going to head upstairs, get some octopus prints, and get them down here and start checking everyone. Then over they go to Jed. Those of you who are waiting. Thanks again, people. I'll be reading the chat here when I have my lunch. So if there's been something I missed, I will see it at that time. Nothing on outside at all, man. Nothing on. Silence. Okay, we'll shut it all down. Thanks again, guys. Bye for now.